Good morning, everybody. I'm Anna Creech. I am past president of NASIG. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'm very pleased this morning to introduce our first vision speaker for you, um, Soren R. So that correctly, yes. Thank you. Good. Um, Soren studied mathematics and computer science at Dresden, Hagen, and Yekaterinburg in Russia. In 2006, he obtained his doctorate in computer science from Universität Leipzig. From 2006 to 2008, he worked with the database research group at the University of Pennsylvania in the US. In 2008, he founded AKSW Research Group at University of Leipzig, which he led until 2013. From 2013 to 2017, he held the chair for Enterprise Information Systems at University of Bonn and led a department at Fraunhofer Institute for Analysis and Information Systems, IAIS. In 2017, he was appointed as Professor for Data Science and Digital Libraries at Leibniz University of Hanover and Director of TIB German National Library of Science and Technology. Soren's research and technology interests include semantic web technologies, of great interest to us, I'm sure, uh, knowledge engineering, digital libraries, also a great interest to us, as well as information systems. So you may be wondering, with all of this background, um, why he is speaking to us. Well, I think he will tell you very quickly what that is, and, and, and it is going to be very good and very important. So thank you, Soren. Thank you very much for the invitation. Especially, I would like to thank Violetta Ilk uh, for uh, and the program committee for inviting me and for setting up this wonderful program, um, which I think is a core part of the of the conference. Um, I hope I can show my slides here. So, first, I would like to show you where where I come from. So, this is um, uh, the University of Hanover. It's actually in a castle. Uh, Hanover was uh, the capital of a princedom in Germany, uh, and there still is a prince of Hanover. I think he's married to a princess of Monaco now. And, um, <clears throat> and next to the, to the castle, we have the TIB, a Leibniz Information Center for Science and Technology, and university library. So we are both the library for the University of Hanover, which is a technical university. Uh, but we also have a national role. Uh, we are responsible for serving the science and technology community in Germany, supplying them as a library with um, publications, with um, access, um, with licenses, but of course also in the digital world with uh, digital information services. And that's a bit what I would like to talk about also today, um, what our vision in that regard is there. And I also, want to start right away with an example of a, of a knowledge graph. Um, that's a bit uh, the, what my talk is about. I think we need a knowledge graph for science, but first I want to confuse you a bit with a small knowledge graph about um, TIB, the um, Leibniz Information Center, and we are the library of the Leibniz University. You see a relationship between the two entities. Um, that's the basic ingredient of a knowledge graph, entities and relationships. Um, but uh, we are also part of Leibniz Association, and now it starts getting confusing, right? The University of Hanover is called Leibniz University of Hanover. There is Leibniz Association, uh, which is actually one of the German research associations. There is Fraunhofer, Max Planck, and Leibniz. Um, so um, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz was the name giver of um, both of the association, of the university. Uh, he was a philosopher, one of the universal scientists maybe, one of the last when it was still possible to cover all areas of science. So he was a philosopher, mathematician, um, worked on very different areas. For example, he also invented um, the binary um, um, digital system, yeah, for, uh, and that's what you see in the, in the logo of Leibniz University, yeah, how to encode numbers in a binary um, number system. So he was a namesake for Leibniz Association and Leibniz University. He was born in Leibniz, uh, sorry, Leipzig, now I'm myself confused, which has nothing to do uh, with the name Leibniz, uh, just very uh, similar in, in pronunciation. And he was also the namesake of a cookie, the Leibniz cookie. <laughs> Those cookies appeared in the end of the 19th century, 1891, I think. And at that time, it was popular to name um, 
uh, cookies or sweets after famous people. For example, you know maybe these Mozart uh, kugeln, those round balls, yeah. So, and actually the university and uh, the Leibniz cookies are produced by Balsen, a food company, and uh, they are on a lawsuit because of the trademark, because Leibniz University also started an online shop uh, where they sell not cookies, but um, stuff about the university branded uh, things, and um, yeah. Okay, so since I'm, I was, I'm actually not a librarian by education. I think I'm a librarian by state of mind. Um, but um, so I also new to the library world. I'm very happy to be here uh, to learn. Um, I also had to learn a lot in the last half a year or last year uh, when I started the position in Hanover leading the TIB library. Um, so I also had to do a bit of research uh, what serials um, are and uh, what it is about. And one thing I came uh, up with uh, were those mail order catalogs, yeah? <laughs> so they seem to have been very popular for maybe hundreds of, hundred of years. Um, so here's a Sears catalog from the, when is it, 60s, 80s? And then there's J.C. Penny. I think you can see up there that it was uh, five bucks at the time. I, th I guess at that time, five bucks were also much more than it is today, right? A bit later, um, the catalog became free. And I think lately we don't even have these kind of catalogs anymore, but of course there were some more. Here are some more examples from the US. In Germany, really popular was this one, uh, Quelle Catalog. Maybe that was also one of the reasons why the Iron Curtain fell down. I'm actually from the east of Germany, and in the east of Germany, it was very difficult to get such a catalog, and once you had one, you were really excited to look all, at all the exciting products <laughs> which were sold uh, in Western Germany by mail order. And you could look at hundreds of watches, for example, and in East Germany, there were only one or two watches to buy in the shops. And this is actually one of the last edition here uh, with uh, Claudia Schiffer on the front page. Um, and there was also a lawsuit and she got in trouble because, um, not because of that, but she was actually suing uh, paparazzi uh, because he took a photo of, his ba of her baby. But on the other hand, she published this um, front page here with the baby on top. <laughs> so she lost the lawsuit because if she published pictures with the baby, then also other people can do that. And meanwhile, we don't have these catalogs anymore. But inside, they looked like that. Yeah, you had nice pictures of the, of the products. Uh, you had um, numbers, order numbers, what you could order, um, descriptions of the features, prices. The prices were actually valid for a whole year. Nowadays, they change within seconds. Yeah. Um, so, and another thing I found were, for example, roadmaps, um, which were popular for a long time. It was very difficult to find a way with those roadmaps. Um, or phone books, uh, which were also popular, and they were published every year. I think it's also kind of serial, right? Every year, a new phone book. Today, I think no one uses them anymore. So it looks like, um, how does it work today? It looks like many of those serials actually disappeared. So today, we buy stuff at Amazon, right? So we don't use these mail order catalogs anymore. We can search for the features of the products also on the site and um, choose uh, products, for example, by screen size, smartphones, or by weight. Um, here's an example of another e-commerce website of a German one. You can really compare uh, lots of features of the product and select a very fine-grained, for example, version of the operating system of your smartphone and the weight and, uh, and many other things. Um, in terms of navigation, we use Google Maps, for example, or other navigation software. Uh, which allows us to navigate um, so we don't need these old uh, road maps anymore. So the world of, of publishing and communication, I think, has profoundly changed um, outside of, of science. Yeah, we'll talk a bit more about science and research later. Um, there are new means which we adapted, and we use these new possibilities of the digital world, right? So we can zoom into information. We can drill down into information on the map or also in product databases. Um, it's much more dynamic. We can access information 
uh, on the fingertip, we don't have to look at thousands of pages in this mail order catalogs, but we can very quickly find a certain product which fulfills our interest. Um, there are business models which completely changed. Many of these mail order companies actually disappeared and completely new players emerged and that profoundly changed the whole economy also. There was more focus um, on uh, integrating information from different sources, um, on collaborating also. If you look at Amazon, it's actually a marketplace. Lots of players, uh, vendors uh, sell their products there and um, many other things. So this, uh, this area profoundly changed. And um, now what about scholarly communication? What, how did it change in the last years or centuries? Yeah? So it started 1665 maybe with the philosophical transaction of the physical society um, in the UK. And then um, in the 1860s, publications looked like that. Um, um, in the 1960s, uh, this is a publication from COD, like the relational data model, um, looks like, like this and pretty much the same. I think it looks nowadays, yeah. Of course, we have a bit of some additions. Uh, we have now open access. We can actually get publications much better through the internet. Access was improved a lot. Uh, we have identifiers for metadata, like authors, for example, with ORCID. Uh, we have um, yeah, open access repositories and archives, but I think the changes are relatively minor if we compare this to the changes in the other industries, right? So if you, if you would um, adapt this example of mail order catalogs, um, basically it would mean that we now have them in a digital form, so you can look at a thousand page PDF instead of the thousand page print catalog and we have maybe a repository website where you can download them from the web. Um, and the ORCID or these IDs, product IDs, that's actually something which they already had at that time, uh, 20, 30 years ago, barcodes for identifying products. Um, so it's, changes are relatively small, I think, in scholarly communication, but I think we need more changes there. And I actually think science, in some areas is seriously flawed currently. There are a lot of problems which we are facing. Um, one is the proliferation of scientific literature, um, the duplication and inefficiency, deficiency of peer review. Um, there is also this reproducibility crisis. I will tell you a bit more about that. For example, proliferation of scientific literature. You all know this better than me, but it basically this is a report from NSF. Uh, it doubled uh, between, almost doubled between 2004 and 14. Not so much because we in, um, in the US or in Europe publish more, but because other players like China, India, Brazil, Russia are now also publishing as much as we publish or try to publish as much or even more. Yeah? I, I read last year uh, China, for example, outnumbered the US as the largest publisher of scientific literature. Um, so there are these increases, and my impression is that often we as researchers, we are looking for the needle in the haystack. It's really difficult to make sense out of this huge amount of publications and papers which are out there. Um, I think it's also one of the reasons why we have this reproducibility crisis. So here this is a study of nature um, where uh, they asked 1,500 scientists uh, to give some insight on the reproducibility and 70% actually failed in reproducing um, other researchers' experiments. 50% uh, even failed on reproducing their own experiments. <clears throat> and of course this varies a bit between disciplines, but um, this is my, also my impression in computer science now, there was a bit of attention, for example, publishing open source software. Once you publish the software in computer science, we can implement things as software. And that allows us to um, then to run the code, basically. And that's one way to increase reproducibility. Um, and we try to incorporate that more, but not always. It's possible, for example, if Google publishes the paper, uh, they will not publish the, the source code also uh, along with it. Um, and uh, so this reproducibility issue and is, a, is, is, is an important factor. Um, I think there is a lot of duplication and inefficiency also in science. We do things over and over again. Of course, it's always different yeah, because we phrase it, we position it different. Sometimes we don't even know that somebody else has done the same thing. 
sometimes we know, but we write it in a different way from a different viewpoint with a different angle, so it looks a bit different, so we get it accepted at a conference, yeah? Um, so how can we avoid this duplication if the terminology, the research problems, the approaches, the methods, um, and also the characteristics, um, and I actually showed the, showed the slide, the evaluations are not properly defined and identified, yeah? So currently we can identify the papers by their document uh, digital object IDs, maybe also the authors, but the things inside the papers are not uh, accessible in a way or identifiable and you need to spend a lot of effort as a researcher reading this, building up your own um, knowledge graph in your mind of the things and then uh, interacting with it. And if, if we would look um, at engineering, for example, architecture, it would not work. You could not build an engine if you don't have uh, exact specifications of the parts of an engine. And the same when you want to build a house. Um, you need exact models and you need overview of all the parts, how they could fit together, and then you could build a house. And I think we need to do the same in science and research. We want to build a house of wisdom, of knowledge in a way, but we need to identify these components and ingredients and parts so that they fit together like a puzzle pieces, for example. Currently, my impression is they don't really fit together and it's very difficult to make sense of it. I think one of the root causes also the deficiency of scholarly communication. Yeah? So we have a lack of uh, transparency. Much of the information is hidden in texts um, and it's very difficult to make sense of this text. Uh, it's difficult to integrate information from different, um, which are published in different uh, publications, for example, putting them together. Uh, machine assistance is very hardly possible um, because of the documents, this unstructured PDF documents, uh, you can do a keyword search in them, but not as a, in a product database, for example, you can look for specifications of products and drill down and exactly find the product you are interested in. You cannot do the same uh, in research. Um, we cannot identify these concepts and terms inside the papers uh, beyond metadata. Uh, we also have this collaboration problem. There is this one brain barrier or few brains, maybe a small set of researchers can work together, but it's very hard to put these pieces together and then uh, work together and it's very difficult to get an overview of what has, done, has been done already um, and how to interact with um, science. And I think we need to change scholarly communication to address these issues, so how can we fix it? And there was this guy, Vannevar Bush, he had already this vision of Memex um, in 1945, I think, he published this influential article, um, um, as we may think, and uh, his idea was that there is a machine which allows us to, to interact uh, with the knowledge and to store our knowledge and to have knowledge at the fingertips. Of course, maybe his uh, ideas of how this could be implemented were a bit esoteric at the time, uh, when you look at the technologies which are available then. Uh, but I think nowadays we actually can build something like this or we are closer to being able to build something like this. And um, I think one ingredient can be linked data. Um, so Tim Berners-Lee is one of the big proponents, the inventor of the web, who also uh, has the vision and the idea to make the web not only a medium for document exchange, but also a medium for data interlinking and data integration and knowledge integration. And it actually becomes already uh, in many ways. Unfortunately, not yet for research and scholarly communication. And the principles there, the linked data principles, is that we should identify um, things with your eyes, have giving them a unique identifier. Of course, we librarians, we always want to have these um, rigid identifier systems like ISBNs, for example, or DOIs, which are controlled authorities, which give those identifiers. But that's very inflexible because I think every researcher needs to create his own identifiers and he should not have to ask his librarian to create an identifier for him. Um, of course, for some things, it's good. There are curated and authorities um, uh, who grant these identifiers, but on this level of the terminology of the research problems, I think researchers should be able to create their own. Um, and then you can also um, 
publish information behind these identifiers so you can look them up. Um, you can return a standardized description what this identifier means or what is meant behind it in RDF and you can include links to related things. I want to show you in a nutshell, I guess most of you have seen it already or know it, how this RDF data model works because it's a basis for building knowledge graphs. For example, we can represent information about the NASIC conference in RDF that NASIC organizes the conference as a triple, as a subject predicate object triple, very similar as we organize um, actually information in sentences. Um, in English especially, it's all uh, quite, uh, quite following the structure of subject predicate object. Yeah? And um, as we can in natural language use the object of one sentence as subject of the next sentence, the same we can do in a knowledge graph and we can start, say for example that a conference starts at a certain date and takes place in a certain place. Yeah? And you already get the idea that you can build a knowledge graph which can grow and you also see that we have here um, these namespace prefixes which come from different vocabulary so you actually can link information from different sources. We see here Atlanta, uh, we link to DBpedia which is a knowledge base extracted from Wikipedia which contains already information about the geo coordinates. If you want to um, pin it on a map for example you can use this geo coordinates or about the mayor of Atlanta or other information um, and so on and so forth. And uh, so this is a way of um, representing knowledge but also linking it um, in a way and follows very simple principle, very basic and I think that's uh, the power also of it that it's a very simple model. If you look at other formalisms like XML or databases, I think they are much more complex um, and um, restrict a bit the flexibility. And we can serialize it also in triples, just write it down. That makes it very easy for machines. If you have triples from different sources, you can just throw them together and you already have a simple integrated knowledge base. So this can be used for building knowledge graphs. So, so here's an example from business because I worked before I joined the library world. I was working a bit more promoting the adoption of linked data and semantic technologies also in industry. And that was one example we created to represent information about companies or organizations for example in a knowledge graph where you have uh, DHL and um, the name. I think uh, Atlanta is also a hub of DHL, as is Leipzig, by the way. Leipzig has the European hub of DHL. Um, and then you can represent information in such a knowledge graph. For example, about the industry, you can uh, attach labels in different languages to make it multilingual, uh, attach also data values uh, like the height of the headquarter or the location, and so on. So this concept of representing information in knowledge graphs is, I think, very flexible to be applied for very different domains. Um, here is this example with a bit more technical details, but maybe I can skip that. So knowledge graphs um, allow us to represent information um, in terms of concepts, classes, properties, relationships, entity descriptions. Um, it follows some knowledge representation formalism, for example, RDF, or then there are RDF schema OWL, which build on top of RDF um, vocabulary and ontology languages. Um, it's in a way holistic knowledge, so it covers multi domains, multiple sources, and also different levels of granularity. So it's not only metadata, but ideally also ground truth or re real data, and uh, it covers also the vocabularies and the structure of the data. And this can be open data, but it can also be closed data. You can integrate both. Uh, you can add derived and aggregated data, um, schema information like the vocabularies and ontologies, uh, taxonomies to categorize things, and links between internal and external data, mappings to maybe relational data if it's stored in the database. And meanwhile, there is a large family of W3C standards for supporting this representation. Um, in um, knowledge graphs and uh, covering different aspects, for example, also connections to different language ecosystems or technology ecosystems like to JSON, to XML, to HTML, you can embed it. Um, so RDF um, becomes a bit a lingua franca for data integration from my perspective. And it's used for various knowledge graphs. Google, for example, uh, builds uh, a large knowledge graph which Google uses to integrate information about the different Google services in the background 
And you can see that when you do a Google search about Atlanta, for example, there is a fact box on the side which shows you information about Atlanta which comes from Google's knowledge graph. And similarly, we have some other knowledge graphs um, like DBpedia is one which we extracted from Wikipedia. Now Wikidata is taking over a bit this task of representing structured information for uh, Wikipedia. Uh, there is also one by the German library community. Here's an example. Uh, the um, German um, um, uh, published by the German National Library, DNB, uh, the Thesaurus, um, representing also or linking uh, different entities there. We have this in different domains, um, so not only Google, but meanwhile also other players on the web and e-commerce um, area use um, this concept of representing information in a structured way. Um, and there is the schema.org vocabulary, uh, which is used now meanwhile by more than 20 25% uh, of the web pages which contain such markup. Uh, in the end, it's RDF triples, which then can be integrated and aggregated. And that, for example, helps to do this product search, uh, Google product search, or other services that you can integrate information in a structured form from different sources. In the life sciences, of course, we have a lot of ontologies, vocabularies, knowledge bases which are used there. Examples are, for example, Bio uh, Portal or Open Facts. Um, and many more. And in the digital library world, uh, of course, we also use that a lot, but currently mainly for metadata. And I think, especially for scholarly communication, we need to go a bit deeper. And that I want to tell you a bit more how I envision that we build a knowledge graph for representing scientific information in the future um, that we uh, get from text to uh, there is now already increasing attention to data and in the future for, for linking this data and the information which is traditionally represented in text um, in, uh, in such a knowledge graph. I want to show you um, some examples. So the idea is that such an open research knowledge graph should describe and identify um, overarching concepts in research and science, like, for example, the research problems, the definitions, the approaches, um, the methods which are used. Um, and then uh, there are also domain-specific concepts. And of course, they vary a lot between the different domains. In mathematics, you have definitions, theorems, proofs, uh, methods. Um, mathematical publications are already very well structured in that regard, but it would be good if you could identify these elements in the documents also and then reference and cite them. Uh, currently we cite on the coarse granular document basis. In physics we have experiments, data, models, in chemistry substances, structures, reactions. In computer science also concepts, implementations, evaluations, uh, in technology or engineering, standards, processes, elements, uh, units, sensor data and so on and so forth. So each domain has its very specific concepts, terminology, and I think we need to make those identifiable and linkable and integratable. Um, and we also need to integrate more artifacts, not only the information which is currently contained in the document, but often we have other artifacts like software, like videos, for example, a talk, um, a video abstract or a talk given at the conference where uh, a paper is presented. Uh, the software code which is hosted maybe at the repository and um, data which is research data which is published in some repository. All these different artifacts should be linked and integrated um, with the publication of the research approach. So and I want to illustrate that uh, with one example. So for example if you look at CRISPR which is a, a biochemistry a method for genome editing uh, which is a very important uh, method you find in Google Scholar more than 100,000 documents. So it's really finding the needle in the haystack. And maybe you are interested, how was this method applied to insects or a special type of insects? Almost impossible uh, to find it because, of course, you can add the keyword insect, but probably in the publication they don't use the term insect. Um, if you look at our TIB portal, we also have a search portal with all the documents which are accessible via TIB. You still have 4,000 results. <clears throat> so, for example, somebody would be interested in um, how this was applied to Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera are butterflies. Um, 
and uh, maybe the, the term insect is not even, uh, even used here and maybe you are interested also in very specifics of the application and would be really difficult to, to find this particular publication. In. And our idea is that in the future we represent information from such a publication in a more structured way, not only on the metadata level but actually on the, on the level of the uh, actual research contributions of the research approaches. And here is such an example. So we envision also that there is something like a curation form, like you create nowadays metadata for your publications. Hopefully in the future we can also get some information about uh, the content of the publications. For example, what research problem was addressed, what you currently describe, what researchers, scientists describe in the abstract of the publication to represent that in a structured form. So maybe that might be in the end 20, 30 statements, facts, um, and uh, then they can be uh, shown in such a, um, or uh, can be represented in such a knowledge graph basically where you link the different entities and you link them also between publications like the research problem addressed, for example here, genome editing in Lepi, Lepi, Lepidoptera can be linked from many publications and Lepidoptera can be linked to insects and in the whole taxonomy possibly of, um, um, of species and you can identify then quickly where, who published uh, research related to applying the method for, for a certain species or um, type of species. And what you also can do and what currently costs a huge amount of time is then once you have such a structured representation, you can give an overview of what's going on in research basically with a, a mouse click or with a query uh, because we can query this knowledge graph and the structured representation. There's even a query language for knowledge graphs called Sparkle, it's standardized by W3C. And if we would have such a structured representation, we could look at uh, what are genome editing methods and how do they compare. Yeah? So what you see here. Um, currently, this would cost a few weeks of time to look at all the research papers, maybe even months. I think often PhD students do that work and work several months of creating a state-of-the-art survey in their field and they have look, to look at hundreds of publications and read dozens of them and then analyze and compare. Um, and uh, this costs a huge amount of time and it's also often not very comparable and not very easy to juxtapose different approaches and describe them. And that's uh, one of the uh, advantages of uh, representing information such a knowledge graph to get a better overview, to be able to compare research and uh, to do, make this much more efficiently. Also, I think uh, interdisciplinarity is very important. We need to work across disciplines, but if it's so difficult to get an overview um, in one discipline, um, it's hard to um, to work in the disciplinary way. Of course, linking all these different um, other assets like open access publications, maybe citations of data, data sets, metadata plays a role, video, audiovisual content related to research, collaborative authoring, maybe also of e-learning material, um, research data, thesauri, all these things should be linked in a way and integrated in such a knowledge graph. And I want to show you another example here. This is one um, work of a colleague of mine. And um, here we have different artifacts. For example, we have information or we have the source code published in a GitHub repository. Yeah? Or there is a video which is on a video research video, scientific video portal, like video lectures, for example, uh, about the authors giving a talk about their work. Um, and we also created actually a, this small knowledge graph for representing information about this particular paper. So you see here uh, that the research approach provides a solution for a certain problem. It supports certain technology. It is implemented in a programming language. It addresses a certain problem um, and so on and so forth. So this is a semantic description of the content of the publication, what you usually have here maybe in the abstract, in a good written abstract, but uh, in a more structured representation. And then linking information uh, from publications um, with those different artifacts like the video, for example, and the metadata, of course, uh, will give you the possibility then to query and to run this and to, to access the information in a, in a better way. 
and in the end to build such a knowledge graph of science which makes it a bit more transparent what's going on, what is currently worked on, increase the efficiency of, of, infra, of science and research. So there are a number of advantages, uh, like in addition to this increased terminological and conceptual precision, um, we have also less ambiguity. I think this is often a problem that people have different, uh, slightly different assumptions, slightly different uh, or sometimes very different terminology, but meaning the same things or sometimes using the same terms for very different things. This is currently very intransparent, very difficult to discover. It takes you a lot of time to find this out. Um, and that would, be, uh, would become much more clearer which when we would represent scientific information in a knowledge graph. We could also trace artifacts and information in a better way. The traceability would be improved. Um, the machine readable, readability allows completely new search, retrieval, assistance techniques. Yeah? Um, possibly maybe in the future, I guess many of you have, have used already question answering with um, Alexa or Google Now. Um, imagine this would be possible to ask um, about research problems and approaches and to interact in an intuitive way with the wisdom of science. Um, currently, uh, this will not be possible with the unstructured documents. We avoid these media discontinuities which we have um, and increase efficiency. Um, we can also improve this interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity by making this more visible, accessible. Um, hopefully there will be also less duplication because it's more visible what has been done before, how it links and even if somebody does something very similar you can maybe, um, uh, it can be more easily discovered or also um, made uh, um, commented on by other researchers and uh, peer-reviewed and contributed. And it also improves the open science aspect that we involve maybe um, other researchers or scientists or citizens um, in, in research and um, make the work, the output uh, more transparent also to them, in a, to lay persons or young academics uh, to give them entry into the research field. Now, of course, there is a lot of work to do, so this is a, a vision and uh, we need to implement that. We started at TIB and also with the community of people. We had one workshop earlier this year where we talked about this. And I think it's a very challenging problem and it will not be possible to do this in a fully automated or way. Of course, there's a lot of talk about machine learning and deep learning, uh, but I think this will not help us here. Why will this not help? Uh, because for deep learning and machine learning you need training data and we don't have the training data. Yeah? So the, of course we have all these documents um, available, some of them available as open access, uh, some we might have access in the library maybe for um, machine processing. But since the documents are in this unstructured form, I think they are not good training data for what, what we actually want to accomplish. And uh, so we need to uh, bring the humans in the loop there. So we need to create good user interfaces for creating this. Um, I think we need some way of crowdsourcing that the researchers themselves maybe add this information to the knowledge graph and link their approaches to other ones. Of course, we as librarians need to help them, to assist them, to create this um, uh, knowledge base. And once we build up more and more of this information, maybe then this can be used as training data for the future to automatize more of these things. So. <clears throat> this good user interaction for the knowledge graph I think is very important. Of course also storing it and uh, showing how it can be searched and accessed um, is important. And as I said, what is uh, really important is collaboration between scientists, librarians, knowledge engineers and then also in the future machines, but I think not in the first place. And that's what we computer scientists, uh, a mistake we often do, we think machines can do the job, but then they reach only 50, 60% precision, and of course this would not help us here at all, yeah? uh, if every second fact we extract from a document is wrong. So, yeah, that was um, a bit an overview of what, what we want to do at, at TIB, and of course we cannot do this alone. I think actually it needs to be an effort probably of the whole library community, maybe also scholarly communication community to work on that. Uh, would be great to stay in touch and um, 
get um, this involved with some of you. We want to start an open source software development project of creating a prototype for such an open research knowledge graph. Um, and there are in, so included some links in the presentation uh, how you can uh, stay tuned. We set up a mailing list, a group for this, um, and um, we also registered the domain org.org, like open research knowledge graph. Uh, currently, it points just to the TIB website, but in the future, we will publish more information about this effort. And of course, it should be a community effort, and everyone, uh, in the spirit of open source, open science, open knowledge, um, because there are, of course, also um, uh, efforts in that direction from commercial player. Um, I think, for example, ResearchGate, it goes already a bit in this direction, uh, or other players like publishers, they build their knowledge graphs for organizing knowledge about scholarly communication internally. But I think it's very important for us um, as librarians, as researchers, to have also an open alternative and a bit of competition in this field. Um, that's what we want to do. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to uh, discuss and to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Anyone? interested to comment on this. Maybe it's also completely wrong. Of course, there are some strong <laughs> statements uh, that we, scholarly communication, in a way, is also responsible for the problems we currently have in, in science. Hello. Good morning. My yeah. name is Ken DeFiori. I'm, I'm with a, a vendor called JSTOR. And we're increasingly receiving requests from librarians and faculty, various patrons of our database, to provide tools and data sets for text and data mining. And as I listen to your talk today, I, I, I hear so many similarities between, between that, uh, your, your knowledge graph and, and what the goals of text and data mining are. And I, I was hoping you could maybe describe the, the potential synergies and differences yep. from what you're doing. Yep. No, I think this, uh, this is a very important question. And of course, text and data mining, um, is, is important, but I somehow don't believe that it will help us uh, to build this knowledge graph as, or in the beginning, because the precision of text and data mining is not high enough. Yeah? So, for example, entity recognition, I think, has my experiences, it works maybe, maybe you reach 70, 80, 90 percent, depends on the domain. And uh, if you look for authors, for example, of publications for metadata, basically, maybe you reach a bit higher, you can reach 90 percent. Uh, but for other things inside the documents, it will be much, much lower. And um, I think even 90% might not be high enough. If 10% of the things are wrong in the knowledge graph, people might be quite annoyed also uh, when, when using it. So maybe we don't need 99%, uh, but um, I think, uh, and as I said, 90% is something I don't think will be reachable for uh, things inside the documents, because we as humans have this difficulty of disambiguating the concepts already in the documents. How should a machine solve this problem without training data? I think machines are only smart when they have good training data, and this training data often is actually created by humans. Yeah? Uh, for example, machine translation, uh, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, the training data, there are translations which were created by human translators, and only after we have a huge amount of these human uh, created translations, machine translation now works relatively well. It would not work at all if there would not be this human manual created training data. And many other areas, voice recognition is, uh, I think, the same. So there are many of these, uh, these examples. We need a lot of transcribed um, audio content to train the machine to do uh, voice recognition, and I think we don't have this for, scholar, for really scholarly communication data and information if it goes inside the documents. And that's why I don't think that these text and data mining, of course, it can be maybe used to create some visualizations or a bit of improving the access, but I don't think we will achieve a, a radical improvement as we have seen this in other domains, like in the e-commerce domain, for example, where we now have these huge e-commerce databases where we can buy products and, and compare them and the features and components. And I think something like this uh, needs a completely different approach, which maybe in the future, once we have the training data, 
um, can use um, data mining and text mining with the training, with the human manual created training data then to create recommendations maybe in the first place and later on also to automatize this process more and more. That's my impression. So I'm a bit skeptical that the machine learning and uh, text and data mining will bring us really a lot forward there. So that's why I think we need this crowdsourcing. We need to integrate it. And that also shows examples like OpenStreetMaps, for example, which created a map of the world by crowdsourcing Wikipedia, um, um, encyclopedia of the world. Um, and there is a lot of power in, in crowdsourcing, putting lots of small contributions together. And it would be great if you could see if that works also for scholarly communication. So while you were talking, I kept thinking, OK, <clears throat> my question is going to be, like, can this be automated? Because all I'm hearing is dollar signs. Because <laughs> human labor is expensive. And, I'm, and now I'm hearing, oh, no, that's not going to happen. So how, how is this even financially possible? We're already, as libraries, strapped with resources. Yeah. We don't have enough staff to handle the, the volume Very of good. information we have right now. And, um, and as you showed, that information is increasing rapidly in the world. Um, crowdsourcing might be one solution, but it doesn't, I've seen crowdsourcing projects that fail. So what, how do we handle this in, from an economic perspective? Yeah, that's uh, probably the, the difficult question here because we are, the library community in a way is very fragmented. We have lots of libraries, I think, which is a big strength, but of course it's also um, then a challenge. And maybe also we need to do things differently. Like in, at TIB, for example, we also spend a lot of effort on cataloging, on um, um, basically assigning also keywords to publications. I'm not sure that this is something which is required in the future because that maybe really can be automatized yeah, uh, by machine and text mining, um, assigning keywords, but it doesn't give you a big boost in usability and better machine assistance. Um, so maybe we need to shift and reallocate resources. And another aspect is we need to collaborate more together. And uh, there are some very good examples like ORCID, for example, or archive and uh, other efforts, um, data side, where we have lots of, of members also uh, from the US and uh, where we already collaborate on some services. Probably we need to collaborate also on this uh, as a team effort altogether, pooling the resources we have and then involving researchers and scientists in some way. And I fully agree. Um, there are some good examples of crowdsourcing, but often also it didn't work in the first attempt. Maybe we need to try several times until we find the right angle and the right way of, of doing that. Uh, that will be a challenge. My name is Susan Davis from the University at Buffalo in uh, the SUNY system. And while I thought Anna's question was maybe going to uh, take the thunder out of my question, your answer did not, so I can ask my question. Um, so your project is, you know, open research knowledge graph, but yet how is the entrance of the commercial sector in some of these open projects? You know, over the years we saw Mendeley bought by a commercial entity. GitHub was just announced the commercial entity is going to uh, buy that with some other projects. How can you do open if there is a commercial, how do you see that working together or maybe disrupting your thoughts about open crowdsourcing, etc.? I think it can work very well together. There are some examples, of course, of open initiatives like ORCID, Archive, DataSide, which uh, are relatively independent, are set up from the governance structure so that they cannot be easily maybe um, taken over by commercial entities and maybe we need something like this here as well, but I, not because we are against commercial use, but actually open means also that it can be used by commercial players. Yeah? And we have in our scientific advisory board representatives from Bayer, from uh, Siemens, for example, and they were very excited about this idea and because they built also knowledge graphs internally in their company if they could use um, the one we create as a basis and then add it with the information and link it with the information they have internally, that would help them a lot. And um, other examples like OpenStreetMaps is such an example. Even Google uses OpenStreetMaps nowadays because um, the map is in many ways more detailed. And um, so 
and there are many other commercial, it's an ecosystem actually of also commercial services and apps around the open, open street maps data. Yeah? And uh, something similar I could imagine here, that such an open research knowledge graph is open, but open also means um, that it can be used for commercial purposes. Uh, um, similarly as open source software. If you look at open source software, every mobile phone nowadays, whether it's Android or even iPhone, they use an open source core as a basis. And many other successful, also the internet servers, for example, are driven by Linux. I think 90% of the web servers are run by Linux nowadays. And companies like IBM are using and building on top of that. So um, I think there is no, um, how to say, um, <clears throat> both worlds can, can uh, work together. Of course, there might be some players of, uh, also in the operating system world. There were some attempts uh, by even IBM also, and also Microsoft, for example, tried to conquer the server market and didn't succeed there. Of course, there might be also some competition, but I think this competition actually will be healthy, and, and we need more competition there. And otherwise, we see this. I don't know how the debate is here in the US. and Germany, we have a big debate that the commercial players are a bit dominating and um, um, occupying the scholarly communication world. Uh, the subscription fees go up, um, and there are currently big negotiations with, uh, pub with some of the large publishers on trying to find a model where it works again. But with some of the publishers, for example, we didn't find um, an agreement, and there is currently all German research organizations, universities, cancel their subscription with one of the publishers, and already for one and a half years, and it looks like it will continue like this because it's hard sometimes to find agreement. Do you think with this structure, uh, the open knowledge graph structure, that there's a risk of like creating higher barriers to scholarship and communication, that the system now is inefficient and redundant, but it's easier to get like an out there idea that doesn't have as many existing identifiers and concepts that it's, the system would you know, create more benefits to things that already have identifiers and already are sort of established or Mm, I think there are some challenges. Of course, knowledge graphs we currently use already in some domains, but this is f factual knowledge, encyclopedic knowledge, for example, DBpedia, Wikidata, or also Google's knowledge graph covers factual knowledge where everybody would agree on like capitals of countries and so on. In research, unfortunately, um, we have such facts, but it takes a long time until they emerge and uh, the scientific discourse evolves over time and that will be, a, uh, I think, a big challenge of how we um, deal with this evolution of discourse and uh, with the emergence of, of concepts and maybe also the disagreements. Yeah? Research communities not always agree on things and how to represent that and um, I think, and that might make it more complicated. So I fully agree there is also the danger of overcomplicating things, we need to find the right angle uh, to make it on the one hand simple to contribute, simple to access this, and on the other hand, um, yeah, reduce this complexity. And I think this is a big research problem. It will probably take many years to, to work in that direction. But I want to, we want to start with maybe small examples in one domain and then going step by step and um, trying to find a solution that way in an iterative approach in a way. And that's what knowledge graphs may be also good. You don't have to have a model in the first place, but you can start uh, step by step. Uh, good morning. Um, I have a question sort of specifically about the, the project you're working on. Is it focused more on creating a, um, a system by which you're going to encode sort of newly formed texts to start with and then subsequently, you know, use that framework to go backwards and do sort of, you know, okay, we published this in this journal last year, let's re-encode the older issues going backwards. I think there's a lot of parallels between moving from print-only journals to their digital copies. You know, you don't have, it took a look, many, many years and tremendous amounts of work to digitize print back issues of, of journals. Is it, do you see a similar sort of process happening with this? 
I think so. Maybe in the future we don't even need these documents anymore. Maybe in the future, of course, you represent your um, contributions right away in the knowledge graph. And maybe you could generate a document out of your contributions. Yeah, I think that would be also feasible. Or you can attach smaller. There are also ideas like micro publications, for example, which are, go in a similar direction that you publish smaller um, amounts of, of uh, content and link them together. And um, that could be something in the future to facilitate um, also the a bit more iterative approach of publishing and, and making, uh, giving access to uh, uh, scholarly communication. But I think until, also one aspect and difficulty are the incentive systems. Of course, they are currently for researchers based on publications, on citations of publications. Um, and um, that is also an open research question, how this could be adapted, for example, in a knowledge graph, where you have more fine granular contributions. How could you measure the impact a researcher made on his field? Uh, with his knowledge graph contributions and um, only then maybe we could really shift from traditional publications to knowledge graph contributions. Hi, I'm curious, you're talking primarily about scientific information at this point. How do you see that moving perhaps to things like social sciences or humanities research, which is very different? Um, you're right, I think in Humanities would be probably a domain I would not start with. <laughs> <laughs> In social sciences, I think uh, it's, a, it's a bit different. There is a lot of, of data, there are methodologies, so I think there is more structured information which uh, needs to be represented. And there are organizations like in Germany, there's GESES, they um, uh, store these data sets and they also work in that direction actually of um, linking the data with the documents and adding more structure to the publications. Uh, but you're perfectly right that different domains um, will have a different pace of maybe adapting that or, or using things like that at, at all. But even I think in humanities it could be interesting, maybe not on such a deep level that you have specifics of an approach, but uh, describing the terminology and linking the terminology which is used in, in, digital, in humanities and then digital amenities. So um, I'm a little bit curious about how the models of open access and open data sharing sort of compare to this because with those movements, I mean, you have like funder and institution level mandates that require the authors and researchers um, to kind of do some of this work. It places some of the labor on them and may have like an office of uh, research support or a library that ensures compliance. Do you think any of this labor could be pushed on to the authors or to an editorial process? Or do you think it has to be like a third party process after the fact? No, definitely. That was the idea of crowdsourcing that, involving the authors, adding this maybe to the submission process. Uh, that's one idea what we want to build now, a widget which can be integrated into the submission process where you uh, create a small snippet of the knowledge graph describing your research. As we have this already for ORCID, you can link metadata, describe metadata, um, and um, I think similarly you could do this also for describing the, the original contributions in a more structured way. But I think in the end we need to give, in order to that researchers really adopt that, we need to give them a direct benefit yeah, that they are willing and interested to do this, to contribute that, that the journal and open access repository um, um, uh, providers are also integrating this widget and don't see it as an additional burden. And we have some ideas in that regard, for example, that you find related work. Once you describe your research, you can easily identify who else has done something similar um, or yeah, giving you also more exposure, maybe increasing your visibility. Um, uh, so these would be, and that uh, is something, for example, why it worked in the e-commerce world a lot, why now 20, 30 percent of the web pages integrate structured data and uh, because uh, it's, it's taken into account and adds more visibility. But probably I think we also need to, as librarians, uh, as information scientists, to look over this and help and support and curate and identify uh, things or create maybe taxonomies, help them, the communities, to create these taxonomies. And that's of course also a challenge because communities are very differently organized, have different um, cultures and bringing this together and then collaborating on such a knowledge graph will not be 
not be easy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Bob Boise from Springer Nature. You knew I had to be here, right? Um, <laughs> the, um, what I'm curious about, because you're right, we do have you know, our own internal knowledge graphing projects that a lot of us in the commercial sector work on. I think it seems to me that the tendency is to get excited about the technology and, and start building, building up amazing numbers of triples. And I'm, I don't know if there is a kind of an idealism there or if people have thought deeply about what it is that questions that we need to answer. You know, what are we going after? You indicated a problem with like reproducibility. Uh, I'm interested in things like not just hypothesis confirmation, but hypothesis generation. And what can the research, what can, what can the research do? In other words, I wonder if people who are building knowledge graphs are thinking, what questions do we need to ask of this yeah. giant corpus of research? And is what we're doing going to help? Yeah, um, I know that Springer Nature is building a knowledge graph. I think it's called SciGraph, Sci right? SciGraph, yeah. Uh, but it's very different from the idea I presented. It's yeah. focusing currently on the metadata, yeah, on the authors, on the titles, on the abstracts, on uh, keywords. I think, as I said, we need to go much deeper. And uh, mm -hmm. that's why I fully agree. Like, on a metadata level, that will not bring the big benefit. But only once we can represent information deeper in the documents, in this knowledge graph, then we can actually create a benefit uh, for, for the users. And uh, that was one aspect. And what was? Yeah, I mean, I was just wondering if you, for example, um, and your people that you work with, have some, have some questions yourself that you were thinking of. It would be great if we structured this data and added in all these knowledge elements to the research, that we would be able to answer certain types of questions by doing that. Yeah. And did you, you know, did you, are you thinking along the lines of what questions you're trying to answer? Yeah, but um, for example, who else solved a certain problem? First, defining the problem, and then who else is working on that? That's the, the standard question you have. And then creating an overview of the approaches addressing a certain problem. How do they compare with regard to certain features? Yeah, and um, that is extremely cumbersome work which we have to do and if we could simplify that and I'm deeply convinced with such a knowledge graph who goes deep into the documents knowledge would simplify that, we would um, dramatically change that. And another aspect you mentioned is very interesting, the, uh, the, the um, uh, generation of hypothesis. Yeah? Uh, that's exactly what I think is also could be a huge benefit to science. Currently we create these hypotheses based on our intuition but uh, with the, if you had such a representation uh, in a knowledge graph, we could discover patterns maybe, or we could discover relationships and, and um, um, uh, analyze them for, for some kind of, and then create basically hypotheses in, an, in a more automated or assisted way. Uh, of course, checking might still require research and science, so. Uh, we don't become obsolete as researchers and scientists, but uh, we would have more variety maybe of hypotheses to, to start with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, um, I'm Amber Billy. I led the Linked Data Workshop yesterday uh, with uh, my colleague Robert Randell. Um, and so for those of you who attended that workshop, I hope you got a little bit more out of uh, Soren's awesome talk. So thank you for your talk. Um, you, you spoke about Vannevar Bush and, and the things that you're talking about with this knowledge graph really reminded me of a contemporary Paul Audley and his, in his work at the Mundaneum trying to organize all the world's knowledge into three by five cards and a multi-million dollar or multi-million card catalog. Um, so in many ways it seems like you have a very similar path um, that you're trying to achieve. Um, are you, what do you, I, I guess I just have more of a comment. <laughs> Uh, sorry, who, who is working on this? No, uh, this was Paul Atlay in the 1930s. Uh, okay. He was in Belgium, so okay. he, he had, uh, he worked uh, with uh, uh, 
La Fontaine to yeah, yeah. design like no there were many attempts before there was also Syke for example another example from mm -hmm. Doug Leonard um, in the 80s 90s uh, to build a big knowledge graph I fully agree but I think now maybe we have the possibility with the internet to collaborate on this so I think it will not work that one or five or a team of ten people build such a knowledge graph but it will only work if we can put thousands of people together or researchers, maybe even mil, uh, millions. And following a bit the example of, of these, like Wikidata is an example where a knowledge graph for encyclopedic knowledge now is built, underlying also Wikipedia. Um, uh, we have extracted information with DBpedia from Wikipedia, where, where, which also went into this direction. Or the other example is OpenStreetMaps, which in a way also is an, a very flexible approach of, of organizing information. If uh, you look at OpenStreetMaps, for example, it's possible uh, it's not just one map, yeah, but it's actually hundreds of maps. You can create an accessibility map, a bicycle map, a map for catastrophe prevention. And why does that work? Because they have a very similar model, actually, data model, which resembles a bit RDF. They have these key value pairs, which can be attached to any line or point or geometric object. And with these flexible annotations, you can create completely new representations. And that's uh, where it worked already. And I think we need to do something similar in science. And it will, I think it will only work if we can, can do it in the crowdsourcing way and uh, involve um, researchers and scientists in that. Yeah, um, Paul, uh, Audley was limited by even thousands of indexers. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be a worldwide effort. So this is fantastic. Yeah. Okay, I guess we are also at the, slowly getting to the end of the session. Thank you very much. It was really great discussing this with you.